isn't it the greatest blessing to have the opportunity for us to study medicine together so that you can perfect your art, become more useful, more beautiful, more helpful to a suffering humanity and yourselves. This is the hematology section. I love hematology. Actually, I love pretty much all of it, but especially because hematology works according to nice reproducible principles that will allow you both to take care of patients and to be able to do well on your test. Now, if this section is 100% useful because every single thing that is the right answer on the test is exactly the same as meaningful, useful clinical practice. It's not like, well, we have STDs. You know, in ulcerative genital lesions, you really can't tell that it's syphilis from it being painful or painless because syphilis, in fact, is one third of the time painful. And the whole idea that for the boards, for your test, that you say it's a painless lesion that needs a dark field, doesn't bear up in reality a good quarter to a third of the time. A quarter to a third of the time, herpes lesions of your genitals have lost their vesicular roofs and they're ulcerative. So it's an approximation. But in hematology, these principles are so useful because this introduction to anemia, no matter what the etiology is of the anemia, the symptoms is not based on the etiology, it's based on the severity. In the hematocrit is above 30 or 35, you feel nothing. Now, whether you choose to say hematocrit or you choose to say hemoglobin, it doesn't matter because the hemoglobin and the hematocrit are in about a three to one ratio. This is 10 or 12 grams of hemoglobin or a hematocrit of 30. It's about the same, whatever you choose to use. Now, when your hematocrit goes down 25 to 30, you start to feel a little tired. You start to feel a little fatigued. You start to feel a little weak, tired, fatigued. You start to tire out because your tank is empty. Now, do you ever wonder what's the difference between tiredness and fatigue? And the answer is, on average, $275,000 worth of debt. That's what the average American medical student has by the time he finishes residency. That's the average, including the people who have everything paid for. So we're not getting a quarter of a million dollars in debt or $400,000 in debt to say, me tired, oh, me so tired. We're getting that far in debt to say, fatigued. I'm fatigued. Now, when the hemoglobin and the hematocrit goes down below 20, 25, you start to get short of breath and maybe lightheaded. Short of breath, lightheaded. Sometimes you might even have syncope down there. Now, if it looks like these numbers are approximate and fuzzy and you can't seem to be sure, did I put the lightheaded over here with this one or with this one or with this one or with this one? It's because the symptoms of anemia are based a lot on how your underlying condition is as a human being. For instance, if you're young and healthy and athletic, you won't even feel a hematocrit of 30. You won't feel that. Pregnant women are routinely walking around with hematocrits of 25 to 30, and except for the fact that they are big and tired and carrying large things in their abdomens, they're not tired from the fatigue of the anemia because everybody who's pregnant has that anemia. They don't even feel it. Now, that's why these are approximations. Remember, the symptoms. It's not the etiology, it's based on the severity. It's not the etiology, it's based on the severity, not the etiology, what people feel. Now, once you have the anemia, whether you're calling it low hemoglobin or hematocrit, then the next one in etiology is the cell size, the mean corpuscular volume. Now, <clears throat> how ultimately, how do you die of anemia? Now, I have put that question live to medical students for the last 25 years. Well, for 25 years have I trained young Jedi medical students and doctors. And you know, 90% of the time, all of a sudden when you say, how do you die of anemia? The average student, even the above average student, all of a sudden is like, uh, die uh, uh, hypoperfusion. That's true, but how do you die? Uh, 
decreased oxygen delivery. That's true, but to what? My hair, male pattern hair loss? What, does my ass fall off? To where? And the answer is, is that you die of coronary, you die of a myocardial infarction. Because if you're a myocyte in the heart, a decreased amount of hemoglobin is the same thing as a decreased oxygen saturation, is the same thing as carbon monoxide poisoning, is the same thing as stenosis. If you're a myocyte in the left ventricle, all you know is you're not getting oxygen delivered. Is that a low hemoglobin hermetic? Is the hemoglobin desaturated? Is it carbon monoxide poisoning? They're all the same. Is it stenosis? So these are all identical, less delivery, less hemoglobin to deliver oxygen, or I've got no, no oxygen on my hemoglobin, or I have a stenosis blocking the delivery of the hemoglobin, or I have carbon monoxide poisoning, where the hemoglobin goes by all 100% saturated, and the hemoglobin goes by the tissue, and the tissues are like, oye chico, dame algo, dame un poquito. Oh, and the hemoglobin says, oh no, this is my oxygen. You can look, but you cannot touch. And therefore, what's the difference? It's like having a rich boyfriend that still makes you split the bill. Nasty, isn't it? And if you're supposed to, you know. So the next thing is the low MCV, the high MCV, the normal MCV. So the next thing is cell size. If you have a high MCV that's greater than 100, do you have a normal MCV that's 80 to 100? Do you have a low MCV under 80? Femtoliters. Femtoliter. <laughs> well, a normal MCV anemia has to be, that can be the anemia of chronic disease, it can be acute blood loss, and why acute? Why only acute? Why not chronic blood loss? Acute blood loss is an MCV that's normal because chronic blood loss will develop in chronic blood loss will develop into iron deficiency anemia. Chronic blood loss gives iron deficiency anemia. The other thing is, when you have an acute blood loss, after three or four days, the MCV actually goes up a little bit. How come the MCV actually goes up after three or four days? The MCV will go up in three or four days? Yes, because <coughs> reticulocytes. Because reticulocytes. It takes two or three days for reticulocytes to start. So when you have an acute blood loss after three or four days, you, when you have an increase in reticulocytes, you can actually get to an MCV that's a little bit elevated. So in acute blood loss today, the MCV is normal. In hemolysis today, the MCV is normal. But if you've got enough time for reticulocytes to be made after two or three days, it'll bump a little bit. Now, the anemia of chronic disease, blood loss, and very acute hemolysis. And that's just sort of a loss inside you. It's like an internally displaced red cell. Now, microcytic anemias, microcytic, microcytic anemias is iron deficiency. The anemia of chronic disease can also be microcytic. Thalassemia can be microcytic. Sideroblastic, interestingly, is most of the time microcytic, although sideroblastic anemia can be macrocytic too, but most often it's microcytic anemia. Okay, sideroblastic is extra iron accumulated in those mitochondria. Knock, knock, who's there? Prussian blue. Prussian, the, so Prussian blue stain gives iron accumulated in those mitochondria for sideroblastic anemia and thalassemia. And thalassemia hasn't changed in its management for the last hundred years and the hemoglobin electrophoresis is still a pain in the ass for people, still difficult. We're going to do thalassemia in the next section specifically on microcytic anemias. So chronic can be either one. Now what's the difference between macro, what's the difference between macrocytic and versus megaloblastic? What's the difference between macrocytic versus megaloblastic? The difference between macrocytic versus megaloblastic. Macrocytic just means the cells are 
large, physically large. Macrocytic can be things, alcohol can be macrocytic, and liver disease, and lipid problems, and various medications, particularly the ones that are folate antagonists. And you can have myelodysplastic syndrome. But megaloblastic, this again is one of those questions that if we were live together, a lot of you would get it wrong. Megaloblastic means hypersegmented neutrophils. Megaloblastic is hypersegmented. And hypersegmented means an increased number of lobes. And that is mostly B12 and folate in the folate antimetabolites, like the methotrexates of the world, and the things that are folate antagonists, the trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazoles, the things that are folate antagonists. Megaloblastic means increased number of lobes. So in the introduction to the anemias, remember, <clears throat> if a person comes in and they're tired and short of breath and fatigued, that will not tell you how to answer the question, what is the most likely diagnosis? And what is the most likely diagnosis is the most common question on your exam, whether that is complex, part two, or USMLE step two, that's the most common question on your exam. You get some history, you get some physical, maybe you get some labs. And then they can ask you the question, what is the most likely diagnosis? What is the best initial test? What is the most accurate test? What is the best initial therapy? Now when the question says, what is the next best step in the management of this patient? What would you like to do? What is the most appropriate action? What is the next best step? Action, do, management. Does that mean a test? or a treatment. Now, the most important thing that you actually get out of being here with us in this course is actually how to be able to put all medical knowledge into answering these questions. Anybody can just hand you a book with a lot of data in it. Uh, the faculty can go up and say, yeah, read Harrison's, read Cecil's, go ahead, go read up to date. But that doesn't allow you to answer the question, what is the most likely diagnosis? What is the best initial test? What is the most accurate test? What is the best initial therapy? Which physical finding is most likely to be found with this patient? What is the most likely diagnosis? What is the best initial test? What is the most accurate test? Which of the following physical findings is most likely to be found in this patient? You are going to study with those questions in mind. And the difference between my books and everybody else's is that the books are written from the point of view of making sure that at the end of the read of that chapter, you're going to walk out with those questions neatly placed in your mind so you will be able to answer those questions and take them out of your mind on test day with the ease that you can reach your hand into the kitchen drawer and pull out a knife a fork or a spoon because you don't know which one you're going to get asked. Will you get asked about anemia? What's the most likely diagnosis? Well, you can't answer it based on symptoms because it's not the etiology, it's based on the severity that gives the symptoms. What is the best initial test? CBC with an MCV. What is the most accurate test? Prussian blue. What is the most accurate test? Electrophoresis. What is the most accurate test? Smear for that hemolysis. What is the most accurate test? Methylmalonic acid level. What is the most accurate test? What is the best initial therapy? Well, in hematology day, your hematology section, hematology is a laboratory day because hematology is the largest collection of one disease tests of any other section. Prussian blue is a one disease test, only in sideroblastic. Methylmalonic acid is a one disease test, being able to diagnose B12 deficiency. One disease tests. Fragmented cells, schistocytes, helmet cells, is a one disease test, intravascular hemolysis. So that is what you're going to do. You're going to study with those questions in your mind and you're going to be pre-wrong, meaning you're going to search for the most common wrong answer 
like those people who are occasionally talking about Schilling's test, is a wrong answer. Like those people who say, do a B12 level first, when you should be saying to do a smear first. What is the most common wrong answer to? So when you're done with reading that book, you will walk into test day with a clear answer to all of those questions. Diagnosis, initial test, most accurate test, initial therapy, which physical finding is most likely to be found in this patient, and the question that's common to every single test in all levels of medicine, which is adverse effects of treatment. Now in hematology, do you think that they're going to ask you the therapy? Hi, a person's got iron deficiency anemia. What should we treat them with? I don't know. How about folate? Do you think that they're going to ask you what the treatment of B12 deficiency is? Come on. Nope. Laboratory day. I hope that by the time you're finished with these sections in this course, that you will have the sense of deep relaxation and mastery of your subject that you've always looked for and the sense of relaxation that comes with knowing that you have the answers to those questions. You are confident and you're clear and you know how to respond so you can be relaxed on test day and give it your best effort. I'll see you in the next section.